Are you ready? The Cornelia Stephanie Show, Wake Up to Love, Your Call to Action. Join Cornelia as she empowers others to live heaven on earth. Cornelia teaches listeners how to be the authority over yourself, embracing your inner guru. Feel yourself uplifted into limitless expansion, integrating ease and grace in a changing world. This show will cover topics such as unconditional love, your physical body, how to be in extraordinary relationships, create financial and emotional wealth, embracing entrepreneurship in the new earth. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Cornelia Stephanie Show, Living Heaven on Earth. Happy spring, everyone. I'm so excited to be with you all today. I'm looking forward to having a wonderful conversation with my co-host, Dennis Gaither. Welcome to the show, Dennis. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here with you. Looking forward to the conversation as well. Looking forward to the topic that you're bringing to us today. And the topic is the peace of God, an introduction to a course in miracles with Dennis Gaither. And it's a beautiful, it's beautiful for the living heaven on earth show because we know that heaven on earth is a state of consciousness and that we get to embody and experience that state moment to moment. And I love the internet because here we are, we're bringing this higher vibrational consciousness and we're bringing the, the miracles and we're bringing God conversations of God, which one of my favorite topics conversations of God, conversations of people. And the episode description for today is the peace of God is everything I want. The peace of God is my one goal, the aim of all my living here, the end I seek, my purpose and my function and my life while I abide where I am not at home, a course in miracles. So excited you brought us this topic today, Dennis. Thank you so much for being here. And what, what inspired you to, to bring the Course of Miracles today? Well, thank you for this opportunity to share about the Course. I would, uh, it's been uh, just such a deep uh, healing and transformative path for me for many years. Uh, and I, I love opportunities to share about it. I, I, there are people that meet at my home every week and we get to share about it together. So I'm uh, actually grateful for this time to share about this to uh, anyone else who might be curious. Yeah, so it's, you know, like I've, I've been, I've, I've been uh, you know, very familiar with the Course of Miracles. And it's kind of like, uh, it's, you know, there's a lot of people that are not. Sure. So that's part of the reason why we want to bring this conversation out today so that we can tell people, what is a Course in Miracles? Can you explain that a little bit to us, Dennis? Sure. In, in 10 words or less. Uh, that, that, <laughs> good luck with that. So in, in, in its most concise way of saying, it's a path of spiritual development. Okay. But it's, but it's, and it's, its way of organizing is kind of unique. It's organized like an educational course. And uh, of course, it's much more than that, but there's a... a a, it has a text about 600 pages long. It's kind of an abstract treatise on the course's thought system. There are 365 workbook lessons. It's kind of a middle section there. And those lessons are probably one of the most transformative uh, mind training programs that I've ever undertaken. And I do remember a little sense of awe about the intelligence behind them the first time I went through. The last is called a manual for teachers, which are, it's in a question answer format. It's the kind of questions that one might uh, find oneself being asked or ask one. It's the kind of questions I might ask or we might ask. Uh, and, and it's actually some of the, uh, a lot of people actually start to read the course there because it's, it's some of the clearest explanations. So themes about the course, it's about love. Basically it's about love and removing the blocks to the awareness of love's presence. So it's also about forgiveness. It's about inner peace. And it's about the healing of relationships. It actually came about in a context of a relationship struggle. Um, but it's, it's, its ambitions, its aim is actually more than just simply feeling good, although that's certainly a byproduct of it. 
Um, but its aim is really to re-educate our way of thinking, our basic way of perceiving reality, of in some ways seeing beyond the forms um, and teaching us to uh, embody and extend that perception. It's a perception of ourselves and everyone as, as really, um, is really a part of one common loving presence. And as we embody that, we certainly experience a, a great deal more happiness, but we also are in a position to extend that to others. The two are interchangeable. It's sharing with others and being in a place of joy or happiness or peace ourselves. One, 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 there's one other thing I wanna just share. I'll read this directly because it's, it's such a potent message and it's from the preface. And it basically says what its purpose is. And it says it's, according to Course in Miracles, its only purpose is to provide a way in which some people will be able to find their own internal teacher. And that's really everything in the Course is about leading us to really connecting with our own internal teacher, the teacher inside that everyone has. So it's not about trying to create some dogma or, or, or or some intellectual understanding, but it's actually a, a, an embodied uh, kind of uh, uh, kind of deeper than just embodied, but it's just actually a really deep uh, knowing of, a, of an abiding presence that we all have. That's actually the greatest gift. It's a lovely gift. Thank you. So it, it invites it invites the student to go in and discover the teacher through the teachings of the higher level of consciousness, miracles, whatever the lessons are, right? And it's inviting the participant to go in and discover what's true for them? Well, in a certain way, it does do that. Uh, but a part of discovering what's true is, is actually uh, recognizing what's not true and, and letting go of what's not true because that creates a lot of veils that, I mean, what's, what's true in us is just there but we don't experience it because of what we've put between us and it. So and that's really what the practice of forgiveness, what miracles are about, is about releasing those blocks. Uh, so so it, it, there's, there's our learning of what we really are is an unlearning of <laughs> what we really aren't. That's true. Uh, we've always thought we were. Yes, yes. Yes. Um, so you are a facil facilitator of the Course in Miracles. And like you said, when we started that you have uh, weekly meetings and gatherings at your home. I know there's many uh, Course in Miracles teachers and facilitators around the world. Marianne Williamson is uh, a, a very big activist of the Course in Miracles and she's been teaching mm -hmm. for years and years and years. And so how did it come into existence? Well, it, in, it, the way it came into existence says a lot about what it is, actually. And, and it began in the mid-1960s with two clinical psychologists. Their names were Helen Shuckman and Bill Thetford. They were professors of psychology at Columbia University in New York. And their context was that their, their own relationship between each other was very strained. They were co-workers, Bill Thetford was the head of the department and Helen Shuckman was a, 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 you know, a, a research assistant there. Uh, their relationship was very strained and also just a lot of the relationships in their department being, if you've ever worked in an academic center, why? <laughs> there's lots of egos there. And uh, at, at one point, Bill, very uncharacteristically because he tended to be a somewhat reserved person, made this impassioned speech that there must that ended with there must be a better way, there must be a better way to have relationships. And Helen, to his surprise, actually joined with him. He said immediately, "You're right. I'll help you find it." And the significance of that is that the two of them joined in a shared purpose. And and shared purposes is uh, a shared purpose is uh, is uh, is a way of transforming our own our own sense of individual separate self ego in relate as in a relationship context. So after that, Helen began having a lot of dreams and other experiences. And in about October of 1965, uh, she per perceived, heard kind of a voice that said, "This is a course in miracles. Please take notes," which totally freaked her out. Uh, and because uh, she knew what happens to people who hear voices. And uh, 
she called Bill sometime in the night and says, told, her, told him what happened. And he said, well, uh, why don't you just take notes and bring it in the morning and we'll see what it is. And if it's gibberish, we'll throw it away. And if it's not, we'll, we'll just continue. So that began a seven year process of, of dictation, of Helen taking inner dictation, bringing it to Bill, and then they would, he would type it up. She had a shorthand uh, that she would use. And it's, it was clear that this is not something either one of them could have done alone. Uh, Helen was the one who actually was able to kind of access directly that, that voice but she was terrified by what she was hearing. It totally did not fit with her prior sense of anything. She would have at that time in her life considered herself to be more atheist or agnostic. And, and what was coming through her uh, was really jarring her sense of who she was and what the world was. And so it was frightening. And uh, uh, so it was really a very much a teamwork. Um, very much a teamwork that brought it into being. And then there are a lot of other synchronicities that led to its being published as a, and something becoming available to everyone. But that was how it began. Um, it's very interesting with this very uh, subtle way of her saying initially in the beginning, there's gotta be a better way. There's gotta be a better way. I wanna find another way to, yeah. you know, to communicate and to, experience these relationships and by her having this it is it, it is such a um feminine act of i would like this to be different i would like something yeah. that that desiring that's that's coming that's coming forth yeah. and so she had that desire and then her what was sort of her colleague her yeah, colleague well, actually the, it was the one who they both shared that intention of a better way bill was the one who actually gave voice to it Okay, he's the one I gave voice to. Yeah, but then Helen joined with him, and who, who gave voice to it is less important than the fact that they joined. Absolutely. That they had the shared purpose together. First of all, that, and then even to listen to, to mm -hmm. listen to it. And, you know, that's also to listen to that voice, mm -hmm. to listen to it and, and trust it, right? right. And they, they supported each other in it. They, they very much did. Uh, and it was a struggle because Helen didn't necessarily always trust it. She, she found it very stressful and very difficult. Um, and Bill at one point said, you know, if I'm going to really uh, embody this to really take this in, I'm going to have to question every assumption about everything I've ever learned. So it does challenge. It is challenging in that way. Yeah, it is. It is. It is challenging in that way. And, and to, to trust that intuitive guidance to trust what it is that you're hearing uh -huh. is, you know, is um, a training. It's a process. It's a, it's, it's a process. It's a pathway. It's a, yeah, it is, you know, it's a way to move forward. It, it is that it is that. Mm -hmm. So, um, wow. We're talking about the course in miracles today, and we are going to take a break on the Cornelia Stephanie show. When we come back, we're going to find out from Dennis, how his journey began with The Course in Miracles and how it's impacted and changed his life. We'll be right back on The Cornelia Stephanie Show. We'll be right back. Hi, my name is Janet Hickox, and I wanna tell you a little story about a story and how my friend Cornelia Stephanie helped me through to the other end of that story. I have gone from the dark of a story I was telling myself that wasn't true to the light of optimism to see my way out of where I was and to where I wanna go. And it all started with uh, her scheduling a session for me to help me reclaim my money or my financial empowerment. Up until that point, I had been telling the story that my business was dying, that my business was not successful anymore and the more I tried to figure out what was going on, the worse I felt about it. And when I had to get ready to do the session with Cornelia, she asked me to go look at the numbers and where I was uh, through the year to date, and then also to come prepared with a number that I wanted to uh, raise my income to. Well, I was quite comfortable with that part, right? I knew where I wanted to be. Uh, what I wasn't comfortable with doing is going and looking up those numbers, but I made myself do it, even though I tried to backpedal my way out of the session, 
um, she didn't know that, but I was going to try to get myself out of the session. And I looked up those numbers and it was incredible that I discovered through that process that my business wasn't dying. In fact, I was doing 12% better than I had the year before. So I was shocked. I was shocked literally at the power of the story that I had been telling for months. But more than that, I was shocked that I had allowed myself to get there. And uh, later in that day when I had my session with Cornelia, she pointed out some very obvious things like, how are you going to get where you want to go if you don't know where you want to go? How are you going to get there if you don't have the goals written out, if you don't have it uh, set up so that you know where you are and where you're going to go? Totally makes sense, right? If I, and I had been in business, uh, somebody else's business as a sales manager for years, and I, I was a national sales manager. I had awards for sales management. I had business awards because of numbers. And yet when it came to doing my own business, I totally forgot all that I'd ever learned. So by the time Cornelia working with me in just one session, got me to look deeper at the numbers and where did I want to go and actually, you know, claiming where I wanted to go. Um, I was filled with a sense of optimism and hope. Like you can't believe it was like, everything shifted for me. And I am so looking forward to our continued sessions to see how far I can really push myself to get where, I, where I've where i only dreamed of being, where I've never taken the dream and actually brought it into concrete existence. So thank you, Cornelia, for the work that you're doing out there. I appreciate it. And I can't wait to see where I go from here. We are back and you're listening to the Cornelia Stephanie show. Dennis Gaither and I are talking about A Course in Miracles today. And boy, oh boy, could we use more miracles on this planet. So I'm, <laughs> excited, that you brought, I am, I'm excited that you brought this topic today. How did you get started with The Course in Miracles, Dennis? Yes, well, the way The Course got started with me <laughs> was... Oh, somewhere in the somewhere oh, probably 20 more than 20 years ago, uh, I was indulging one of my addictions, which is used bookstores. Oh, <laughs> I have a hard time passing by used bookstores without wanting to see what's in there with, among those dusty volumes. And I was in one that I hadn't I kind of came across one in San Francisco that I hadn't seen before. And I uh, was in there looking for I don't remember exactly what I was looking for, but it wasn't, of course, in miracles. <laughs> But as I was walking out, there was this blue book and it was kind of stuck out a little bit and kind of that's kind of an interesting title. So I grabbed it um, along with whatever else I got. And um, and I bought the book and took it home. And um, and that was the start. But it, it was not uh, easy going uh, at first. As I started to read the course, I found that I couldn't make much sense of it. it impacted me like it did Helen Shuckman. What is this? This, mm -hmm. isn't, this isn't the way I thought things were. And, and also the, the way it's written. It, it does challenge our current conceptions and perceptions, but it's also written in a somewhat nonlinear kind of way. And, and some things about the vocabulary uh, were kind of triggering to me. Um, there were a number of different things, but the, so what happened then was that um, it got put in storage as I got rid of most of the things that I owned. Somehow that book, I guess that you might say that was the first miracle for me is that the book didn't get thrown away. Uh, it went in storage and I basically was doing other things for a couple of years. Uh, I was sp spent some time in New Mexico living in a Sufi, in Sufi foundation for, for a few months and other things. When, but eventually I found myself in the Seattle area. But in the course of those of those travels, I ran across several people who had had really transformative experiences just doing the lessons, just doing the workbook lessons, those 365 lessons. And at a certain point, I just decided, okay, I'm going to start doing the lessons. And, and it, gosh, it probably took me about six months to get as far as lesson 30. So there was a lot of starts and stops and hesitations. But I noticed something shifted inside mm. and it was kind of subtle but it would but it where it propped up was in relationships 
and 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 uh, and there was a and it was kind of like there was this revelation to me that there actually was if i could come to a place of willingness inside which is just like an inner softening and bringing whatever it was my perception about a situation or a person or even myself might be just in this place of willingness means that i'm willing to see it differently if i were to put words to it um, that there actually was a presence, like I would call it a voice, but it wasn't necessarily a voice speaking with words that would show me a different way of perceiving a situation. And inevitably, it was a more connecting, loving way of seeing things. And, and, and it, there was a sense of relief with that, but it also really impacted the behavior of people around me as well. Uh, it's like, you know, situations with, at work or with important people in my life that just seemed to be at loggerheads. Uh, suddenly became much easier to resolve when I let go of something in myself with some help from that presence inside, that voice inside, which as I came to study the Course more, the Course actually uh, calls that variously, calls it Holy Spirit, it calls it Voice for Love, it's, a, it's just, or you can call it your higher self. What symbol you want to use is less important than the experience of it. And so that happened as I was that really had an impact. And then I started really taking these lessons a lot more seriously and really going into them, applying them as best I could. Um, and as I went through that first time, I, I really had a sense of an awesome intelligence behind those lessons. Read superficially, you wouldn't get that sense, but as I actually started applying them, um, and, and it was like, wow, this is the most amazing mind training program I've ever encountered. And uh, so, uh, you know, and I, I knew then I had a feeling, you know, I, I bet I'm probably only getting, I just had a sense, I'm just getting maybe 10% of what's here to get probably this time. I'm going to be doing this from now on. Oh, wow. And it was about 20 years ago. I'm still doing it. Uh, I don't necessarily always do the lessons in sequential order now. I often will kind of, kind of just wait and 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 the, the, that internal presence will suggest what would be a good practice for the day or something like that um, but but they have been uh, truly transformative for me um, and interestingly by uh, actually applying them in my life they made uh, a lot of things about the, the text which I initially found so difficult they made a lot of that became a lot clearer it became just as a friend of mine told me, you know, you do the lessons about lesson 80, the text will get a lot clearer and it kind of has much wow. to my surprise. So there's two books, there's the, the, the text itself and then there's the, the lessons. Well, it's actually three books in one. Three books in one. And initially they were three separate volumes in the first editions that came out. Um, but now they just bind them all into one. Um, and uh, the text part is about 600 pages long. The workbook for students is a, is a 365 lessons. And then the manual for teachers is a smaller. Uh, and then there were a couple of supplements that were also uh, kind of dictated by that same process uh, after the course was published. And one's called Psychotherapy, Purpose, Process, and Practice. And the other's called The Song of Prayer. And some of the newest editions of the course actually have those bound uh, as well. Um, all of them are extremely rich. So where can people find, you know, find out more about The Course in Miracles? Where can they get the workbooks? Where, they, where can they find a facilitator? Okay, well, there are lots of places. Um, there are certain websites. There's actually a lot of them, actually. Uh, ones that I have found to be most useful as a resource not only as a source of the course, but as accompanying materials that can really be helpful. And one that I really like is called Circle of Atonement. And it's based in Sedona, Arizona. Uh, Robert Perry and Greg Mackey have been contributors to that for many years. Um, and I, I, they've written a number of books and I appreciate them a lot. Uh, another that I actually really appreciate is Pathways of Light. And they actually have a minister training program and I went through their program a few years ago. Uh, but they are uh, have always been very supportive. Miracle Distribution Center, based in Los Angeles, has a lot of resources, and including one of the things that's very useful, it has a listing of study groups all over the world. And you can go on that website and find, uh, find a study group, which is one of the best ways to study the course is with a group. Right. Uh, 
you know, I, uh, in terms of finding the course, you can get them on Amazon, you can get it at any of those websites, uh, uh, and, uh, or I mean, find them in used bookstores. I buy a lot of them in used bookstores, take them home and, and share them with our, with a, a group that meets at my home. I have a group that meets at my home on Wednesday nights and we have, in one form or another, we've probably been meeting for pretty close to 20 years. Not the same people as initially. People come and go. And of course, it's evolved over time as we have, as I have. Um, but one thing that's kind of, that's been really a common thread throughout is just delightful. Uh, it's just delightful. It's always just delightful group of people to be with. Uh, and for some, you know, the course is really their, a court, the course is really their path. And for others, they're just kind of there because they liked people. That's fine. I don't. I have no interest in self in, in selecting people. They select themselves. Everybody's welcome. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah. So that's that 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 is definitely relationship building, right? It's a because again, well, it really is. the course is about relationships, right? The relationship you have with yourself and with everyone else, and the relationship you have with life. And so now you're. Um, it's like you said, the course changes you. It, it, it starts working on you, even when there's the resistance, right? Like it, it, it does actually. Yeah. I, I think things move faster when, when there's not, but, but I, I think there is, uh, I mean, anything whose goal is to really turn, is to reverse our, our thinking, our perception, uh, is going to run into a lot of resistance because, because we're pretty attached to our sense of who we are, you know, this little, this, this personality thing, Dennis is kind of attached to this idea that Dennis is sitting here in this body and, and he's different from every other, other body. Uh, and, uh, and so there's a, there's a part that, you know, in all of us, me too, that, that kind of struggles with letting go of that. Uh, even though, you know, the, the little personality self is like, like this, but the, who we are is like that, but bigger. So. Yeah. Yeah. The ego is always, uh, wanting to hold on to that what it knows what it knows and mm -hmm. letting go is is always the uh is always the challenge to i i call us the letting go tribe i call mm -hmm. us the letting go tribe because that's really like you said earlier you said it you said that we have to undo we have to undo and we have to examine what needs to be let go what needs to be undone so that we can move back into our true organic state Mm -hmm. Right. And um, release some of the old conditioning, the old negativity, the old things that 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 certainly are not who we are. Because, yeah. Right. And that's that's the whole piece. So um, let's talk about we're going to go ahead and skip the break today, Dennis. Um, right now, I want to talk about miracles. And so what exactly are miracles? OK, so basically miracles are are about love and it's the shortest and the shortest and let me read you something here about about um a miracle where did it go yeah. oh here it is i'm going to read you a passage here from the course uh right at the very beginning it says miracles occur naturally as expressions of love the real miracle is the love that inspires them in this sense everything that comes from love is a miracle so miracles are expressions of love. Any time that we are turning from grievance to kindness to forgiveness, uh, that's that's an expressing love. That's a miracle. But it's also, even in a deeper sense, and much of the course is devoted to miracles as uh, as the little shifts in perspective that heal our blocks to love, heal our blocks to knowing the love inside of us, heal our blocks to perceiving a loving self in ourselves and others. So much of the focus is about uh, shifting our perspective. And the miracle is, um, although its, its aim is that shift in perspective, a shift in perception, uh, seeing beyond the surface. And, and it's really about, and, and you know, you, you kind of mentioned something about letting go um, shifting our perceptions. What we're actually offering is not so much we're doing it as we're offering our willingness to have it be shifted for us. Yes. 
So I can ask, how can I change my perception about X, this idea that my neighbor done me wrong or something like that. And maybe on the form of level of form, he did something, but my perception of him is something that I'm projecting into who he is, who I think he is. And if I say, how can I change that? Well, I'm, I'm actually misunderstanding a little bit. It's more about, I'm going to offer my willingness. I'm going to offer my own way of seeing my own perception, which is based on my own patterns, my own projections. So I, I create some sense of willingness around that. And then there's a presence inside that can show us another way. And it guides us step by step awakening from this dream that we're in, in which we all seem to be separate, different agendas. Yeah, so, it's beautiful. Yeah. Let me, I'm, I'll read you another thing, thing here about miracles here, about that shift in perception. So miracles honor you because you're lovable. They dispel illusions about yourself and perceive the light in you. They thus atone for your errors by freeing you from your nightmares. By releasing your mind from the imprisonment of your illusions, they restore your sanity. So miracles are like, this is a, an integral part of our path of awakening. In our deepest truth, we don't need to awaken. That's, that's never been, you know, we've never really left our connection with source. But here where we imagine that we have, miracles are, are our path home. That's what helps us to come home here. And it's sort of like, um, and, and, it, and they're inner shifts. You know, sometimes as a result of a miracle, there'll be something that changes on the outside. Sometimes even a physical symptom or some other uh, illness might resolve itself. Sometimes, not always. But, but that's actually not what a miracle is. And it's not about getting a great parking spot. Uh, sometimes, you know, if those changes in the outer form happen, it's a result of the miracle, not the miracle itself. Right. So the fact that maybe some situation I have with another person that was at loggerhead suddenly releases and becomes easier to resolve in some way, that's not what the miracle is. That's a result of the miracle. The miracle is what uh, is the shift in perception inside. Right. The miracle happens inside. Yes. It's an, it's an inside job. It does have in this level of form in which we find ourselves, it does have an outer expression that can reflect the miracle, but it's not the miracle itself. If I change my perception to something that's more loving, I'm gonna act in a more loving way and experience a more loving world. But that's a result of a miracle. Yes, yeah. And why do you think that um, some people have a hard time with that? Do you think it's because they are, are holding on to a, a level of resistance or a level of non-willingness? Well, um, all of us actually have a, a certain amount of non-willingness or resistance because of, well, it's, let's, let's kind of make it, I'll make, draw a little, see if I can draw a little imaginary picture here. Mm -hmm. If we can imagine that who we really are, if I, if I, you, on the audio you can't see this, but I, I extend my arms as far as I can. Who we really are is kind of like like that. We are. It's like we're 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 actually just extensions of source. You could call it the divine God, whatever. We're extensions of divine love. And and, but there is a part of us that uh, is imagining itself as separate from that. It gets to have its little experience of separation. And you can kind of imagine a story in which we're all kind of extensions and we call ourselves, we could just kind of call all of us God's child. Like we're just extensions of that. And God's child has a thought of, I wonder what it would be like to not be a part of everything. What it would be like to be special, to be separate. And it's, it's, it's actually not possible to do that. But God's child, all of us, carries the same capacity for creativity as source does. And so we can create an experience of separation, an experience of a separate identity. And this little, this little separate identity, I'm going to say little Dennis here, uh, is, uh, is very vulnerable. 
and it has a sense of something bigger than itself and it just kind of imagines that that bigger than itself can completely annihilate it and so there's it so it's very invested in protecting its little identity and it knows it's on shaky ground and so every because of that every genuine spiritual path that really involves awakening from that smaller identity um, you will encounter places of fear mm -hmm because it feels fearful to let something that we've identified as who we are go. And so for, for almost all of us, we do that in little increments. Um, it's not possible to let go of something if you think it's what you are. And so if I think I'm a dentist, I'm a little individual self here, I'm not going to be able to let go of that as long as I really think that's what I am. So we let go of it in little bits. With each little miracle, each little forgiveness, we get a little glimpse of something of ourselves as something larger. And so we start to develop more of a sense of maybe I'm not just this little self. And then it becomes easier to do. But it's a process. And nobody goes, uh, well, okay, I won't say nobody ever, 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 ever did, but nobody I know goes straight to from this, you know, dream of separation to awakening. We all have our own little route. Uh, and along the way, we learn a lot of lessons and have a lot of experiences. And uh, I can't say that I necessarily know exactly what the purpose of it is. I have a certain abiding faith that it is uh, for some purpose. And, uh, uh, and uh, but what can happen is uh, uh, we can kind of start holding things more lightly. That, yeah, that definitely is, is being able to hold things more lightly and also make room in our physical body, releasing some of the density and the heaviness that we've been lugging around. Uh -huh. that's, I think that's part of what you're talking about when you're talking about, um, you know, the little self and then also the, the truth of who we are, being able to embrace that, that, that child mm -hmm. God the truth of who we are, being able to make room for that and let that take over in our, in our lives, in our, in our bodies, uh -huh. so that we can hold that amount of light, right? And because uh -huh. that's, that's true, that is the truth, but making uh -huh. room, having to let go. So cleaning house, cleaning out, yeah. it, letting go, right? It's, it's like that. And, and the Course actually describes that letting go process, that waking up process, as one in which we have little moments of waking up. Yeah. The Course calls those holy instants. We get a little glimpse here. And then the personality self, the, what we call ego self, you know, reasserts itself. Uh, and then at another moment, there's another holy instant, maybe at a point where we let go of something that we've been holding. And... Uh, we, we have more and more of those holy instants. And also, um, we can experience ourselves as uh, living from that place of separation as well. And it's that's part of the awakening process is knowing which one you're in. Because we have, uh, we have two diametrically opposed, we're all channelers, actually, we have two, two thought systems going on inside of us. And one of them is constantly saying, mm, you're separate, you're separate. And it's a dangerous world out there, and there's not enough, and there's all and that, but there's an identity that's created around that, that even though it causes a lot of suffering, it's still scary to let go of. And then there's, and it's kind of like that way of thinking ego that lets us have this sense of separation. It's always evaluating, dividing, separating, hier hierarchizing, if I can coin a term, it's doing all that. But the presence, the voice for love that is always there, it just does one thing. It just is just extending love. That's all it's doing. So anytime we shift in the direction of just extending love, we're actually aligning ourselves with that inner inner voice. So, um, so we're actually we're actually all natural channels. Channeling is not something exotic that only a few people do. It's more a matter of just being aware of what which one am I doing right now? Right. Who am I listening to right now. It's either the uh positive or the negative it's either the which voice are you listening to you're listening to the positive or the negative voice and because we're like you said we're we're all channels channelers we we channel all the time it's just which one are you which one are you channeling now well you know actually i don't know that i would put the label positive or negative uh on on them um uh, it might be more of am i at peace or am i not 
Um, and there's, there is a different feeling inside. For me, at least, there's a sense of spaciousness and openness inside versus a kind of a place of constriction. And I may not actually be aware of which one I'm in until I actually stop and look. Uh, because the, uh, the, the, the presence of, of, of ego tends to run its own show pretty easily until we actually notice it and choose to make another choice. Absolutely. And most likely you're going to be choosing something that's going to make you feel better, make you feel lighter. That's something that is more truer for you than what you were in the, than the place that you found yourself in. Now, do you have an exercise that we can do today, Dennis? Well, there's a few things we can do here. And yeah. uh, there's a couple of things I want to just kind of uh, do here. Mm -hmm. I want to have a, there's a little practice we can do about willingness here first. Oh, good. Willingness is an important part of this. So I'll, I'll describe it and we'll, I'll demonstrate it here. And I'm going to stand up for those. There's a, there's a YouTube video that we'll be able to see, but I'll just describe it. I'm, I'm actually getting out of my chair and standing up here. And if I stand with my knees locked, and my elbows extended, my fists clenched, pointing back. You can do this at home if you want to, either now or at a later time. And then just to add to the effect, think of a time when I knew I was right, and if they would just get my way, by golly, everything would be fine. And notice the feeling of that inside. And then take a moment and soften the knees, relax your arms, turn the palms forward, and notice what happens inside. Just take a, a, you can just notice what happens inside. There's a spaciousness that often people will experience inside. And, and that spaciousness is, is kind of pointing in the direction of, of, of a felt sense of willingness. Because I wouldn't say it's synonymous, but it kind of points in that direction. Something softens inside something kind of eases off and and so connecting with that is the first step of of uh, of a miracle it's beautiful and and so simple it's simple when you remember when we remember to do it uh it's i you know another you know i might take a breath i might pause i might just kind of you know, I don't necessarily have to do those body movements to create the sense of willingness, but it's like, okay, this is where I need to kind of come to. This is in this space that uh, something different can arise. I, I, I love the passage quote from a uh, Buddhist teacher, Pema Chodron, our anger is a result of seeing incompletely. It's, it's like there's more space. There's a more bigger way of seeing. I always, you know, with my book that I wrote, Peace, the Flip Side to Anger, I wrote in there, and this is what I teach, that a lot of times when people are angry, it's just the anger is there because underneath that anger, there is a feeling of not being able to communicate really what, what is really, really our truth. And we're mm -hmm. angry about that. Being able to release that anger and let that go, that's when underneath there, there's the truth, there's the, there's the mm -hmm. magic. That's where, where wow. really the, the gold is. Right. Yeah, right. Well, the, and and the the gold part of that is in recognizing that whatever the the, the angst that I may be experiencing, um, it's not a it's not I'm not directly responding to the situation. I'm responding to my idea about the situation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, and that can be on the one hand unnerving because we're always thinking that we know what it is we're upset about or think we do. But it also is very liberating because now I, I'm in a position where I can actually begin to take some responsibility for it. Absolutely. That's, That's not right. means blame, but I mean, it, it's like I'm able to have a different inner experience. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and especially if there's some, there's a willingness to see it differently. We can play with this a little bit though. We, we can do a little exercise here in this last little bit of time that we have. Yeah, we have, we, we don't have much time. So Let's, okay. Let's go with it. Okay. So let's just play a little bit here. So we, we talked a little bit about this ahead of time. It's called the rock practice. 
And the rock practice came as a result of really wanting to find a way of explaining what it means when we let go of something inside of ourselves, when we actually turn it over to spirit, in other words, and, and receive something in the space that's left. Uh, many times it's misunderstood as simply trying to get rid of something you don't want. And it's not, it's not the same. So we'll do briefly, we'll just kind of talk a little bit about this practice here. So uh, I have a rock in my hand. And in this practice, I am going to, uh, in a moment, I'm going to just allow that rock, I'm going to basically take myself into some specific situation. I don't necessarily need to share about the situation, but but maybe what what was the belief or idea about myself or the situation that I came up with? Or that was, not that I came up with in the situation, but that was driving the way I experienced the situation. And I'm going to give the rock the meaning. I'm going to let it hold it. And then do a little meditation with myself here of coming into a place of willingness. I'm just willing to see it differently. And it's like offering it up to spirit, whatever it is. And when I'm ready to let it go, I will hand the rock. We have to do this because you're miles away, Cornelia. I, I will kind of hand this to Cornelia, which in this case, I'm going to set it on my desk, but she's got her rock on the other side that she's going to pick up and hold. And then uh, I will invite uh, Spirit to just uh, give me another meaning that this rock could hold. And when I've come up with that, I'll tell Cornelia what it is. And then she will, using my own words, give the rock back to me with a new meaning. That's Perfect. the idea of the rock. So I'm going to see what I can come up with here. I'm going to do this. Um, let me just see what comes up here. So basically what it is, there's a situation in which I really didn't fully express what it was I wanted in that situation. And I somehow thought that maybe that wasn't important. It turned out that would have been a good ingredient to have in the conversation. But, but, the, but what was happening to me was a holding back as a result of a feeling of, oh, well, what I have to say is not important. So, so I'm going to take this rock now and I'm going to actually... You know, in doing this in, in actuality, I might take a lot more time with it than I would be doing right now. Right. I might spend a lot of time just really uh, letting this rock embody that and feeling the weight of it and noticing what it feels like to carry that idea around and that there may be a lot of situations where that same belief has been applied and, uh, and almost certainly there are actually and it may be going way back to a much younger age, almost certainly, yes. But whatever, but but I'm also then then going inside. I'm doing that right now, taking a, just a moment of quiet time here, and just in creating that sense of spaciousness, of willingness inside, and bringing that idea, what I have to say is for my what I want's not important, and just bringing it into that space and letting it be there. And again, I might take a lot more time doing this than I will right now. But when I'm ready, and it's kind of like I can feel something inside me letting go internally, at that same moment, I'm going to hand this to my partner here. It's great to do this with another person, but, but we're doing it virtually here. I'm, going to, I'm setting it down on the table in front of me, and now Cornelia is picking up her representation of the rock, which says, be kind. Isn't that delightful? <laughs> Sweet. And so now I'm going to just be back with myself for a moment and just noticing for first, just what's it like just to not be holding the weight of that rock? What's it like to just not be holding the weight of that belief? And then and again, I might take a lot of time with this, but in this exercise, I won't. And then I'll ask, I'll just invite that voice for love inside. The Comforter, Holy Spirit, whatever name you want to give it. I'm just inviting it to show me another, something else that, another, another meaning that rock could have. And so what I, what I experience coming there 
and it, it, I could put it to words and it would be like something inside that just says you're worthy. But there's more than just the words. There's a real feeling of, uh, there's a really feeling of along with that, like a really real affirmation, like it's coming from a loving place. It's not just somebody saying you're worthy. No, it's like you are worthy. That's what's coming. So then the next part, Cornelia gets to hand me the rock back. You can, you get to hand it back to me. She's handing it back and I'm gonna take the rock back with a new meaning. You are worthy. Yes, and she says, says the same words I just said to myself. She, it comes from outside. So then I get to hang out with the new idea here. You're worthy. And really to just embody it. What's it feel like to really take that in uh, so that it's not just an intellectual concept. I might want to sit with it and uh, just let it flow through different scenarios. I may want to get up and walk around holding that energy. Um, I may want to just for the rest of the day, just notice myself in interactions with other people, affirming their worthiness and my worthiness. So many examples. So putting whatever the shifted perception is into some kind of interpersonal accept, uh, expression, even if you're not telling them the words directly, but some interpersonal expression uh, is an important part of integrating and nailing it down. And that is a miracle because it's that inner perception that, that creates the shift, right? That's, that's right. Yeah. So that, that's a beautiful way to uh, describe how you can perceive your own miracle as you're uh, sitting there, you know, creating, a, uh, having an experience and then creating a, a shift of perception with whatever it is that you're ready to release and let go of, or even, mm -hmm. you know, look at it in a different way. Whatever there's some willingness around and um, there does need to be at least some willingness. It doesn't need to be complete. If there's even a little bit, my spirit will work with that. Um, if, I, if I could have complete willingness, I would, I would just sort of be this enlightened being that nothing would ever touch me, but, but that isn't the case. I, but I do have to have a little bit of willingness at least. Absolutely, absolutely. So Dennis, this was a beautiful exercise. Now we just have a couple minutes left. What do you wanna leave our listeners with today in regards to the Course in Miracles and perceiving miracles and uh, what do you wanna leave them with? Hmm. I, I think I would leave them with the, with really a sense of gratitude Mm. great fullness that the gift to me has been most of all there have been many gifts but one of them is that there's an abiding presence with each of those little shifts each of those little miracles um, there's actually a little bit of more of a, of a sense that comes together of a presence inside and it can go by different names and sometimes I experience it by by name of but 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 sometimes I just experience it as part of me um, but in moments where I might feel alone, mm. uh, there can be, a, oh, okay, there is that presence. I don't have the fearfulness about being alone that maybe I once had years, years ago, uh, or painful experiences of loneliness. They, they, um, you know, it, it just doesn't happen in the same way or f fearfulness about connecting too. Uh, there's, a, there's a sense of peace. So those are experiences that I've had. Um, I've been doing it, working with this a long time, and that there's always something new. Um, there's always just something new. And, uh, and so and there's a joy in sharing. Uh, those are, there's just many gifts. And those are for me. Those are ones that I've experienced, but I've seen a lot of other people experience that as well. Yes. And so, again, give us um, a couple of places where people can find the Course in Miracles website. So if you Google Circle of Atonement, if you Google Foundation for Inner Peace, which is the original website, uh, uh, Miracle Distribution Center, Pathways of Light, and oh gosh, there, there are a lot of other ones. If you just Google Course in, A Course in Miracles, you'll, you'll probably get pages and pages and pages. And, you know, if people are interested in coming to a gathering that happens at my home every Wednesday night in Mount Vernon, Washington, uh, you're welcome to uh, uh, get in touch and uh, you can... Everybody's welcome. 
Yeah, and the way that they can get in touch is go to dennisgaither.com and there's a place where there's a contact form where people can connect with you. So, yeah, and did you have, did you have, uh, let's see, did we list everything? Did we list everything that we wanted to talk about in this talk with the Course in Miracles? And the next, the next conversation that you're bringing is a conversation about forgiveness. We want to, we want to highlight that. Right. The title of that talk is "You Have Not Lost Your Innocence." That's going to be that's going to be wonderful. And uh, and it's a talk about forgiveness and uh, transformational forgiveness. We can all use a little bit of that. We can all use it. Yes, and we can all share it. Yeah, thank you so much, Dennis, for bringing us the Course in Miracles today. It's a beautiful conversation. I love the little exercise that that uh, that you bring, the playfulness of how we can shift our perceptions in the moment if we have a little bit of willingness. Just all it takes is just a little bit. And thank you so much for, for coming on and, and bringing your wisdom. And thank you, everybody, for listening and tuning in. And we'll see you again next time on the Cornelia Stephanie Show, Living Heaven on Earth, together with you. You've been listening to The Cornelia Stephanie Show, Wake Up to Love, Your Call to Action. Tune in each week on Transformation Talk Radio. Cornelia's joy is to engage others in practical ways, showing us how to live in the new earth in harmony with our true nature. For more information on Cornelia and her extraordinary work, or to listen to past shows, go to her website at corneliastephanie.com.